we have a wee bit of time for questions and discussion and uh, all that good stuff. So. You should be giving this in a school. Yeah. Absolutely. I would love to. I would love to. Did you get the chance to do that? Um, so far, I have only spoken, with this presentation, I have only spoken to uh, college level, university level, um, and social workers, service providers. Teachers? Not teachers yet, no. It's very hard to get into the schools, and this comes up actually with most of my talks is how do we get this into schools? And it's very hard, but thanks to LGBT Lanark County and the Safe Schools Committee here locally, uh, I will be doing an anti-bullying presentation at PDCI in November, which I'm really looking forward to. And uh, if there's opportunities to, to uh, do the LGBT thing, then uh, very happy that because especially with young people it's just so much fun you know there's just energy in the room and dynamism and and they're they're not set yet right I think most people in this room we're all on the same page and it would be nice to see people in this room who aren't on the same page as us and um, because um, it's just absurd and the reason people aren't on the same page with this stuff is because they don't give themselves the opportunity to see differently right so how to break through those shells it's hard there's no such thing as a silly question, so I don't have to choose. First of all, where the word gay came from, yep. I don't really know the history. And also, when we talk about gay marriage, but it seems when we talk about LGBT, whatever, we separate lesbian and gay. So when we talk about gay marriage, are we talking about females and males? And do lesbians, uh, do, do they mind being called gay? Like, does that term cover? Yeah, you know? um, very good question, actually. Yeah, gay is, is, is basically an umbrella term for uh, homosexuals. Mm -hmm. Um, where it came from, well, obviously it used to mean happy. Um, it would have happened, uh, somebody knows better, but I would guess in the 60s is when the transition began to occur between it meaning happy and it being used to, to define homosexuals. Um, I think that with the rainbow flag, I don't, I don't actually know, I don't have an actual answer. But I've thought about it. Why would we use a, gay, a word that used to mean happy? to describe this group of people. And I think that there is great happiness for people who come out and say, this is who I am. And the rainbow flags, it's bright, it's happy, right? So I don't see them as, as having no connection, but I don't actually know how that happened. If somebody does, you're welcome to speak up. Um, but certainly, lesbians and gays, um, there would probably be some lesbians who would say, don't call me gay, I'm a lesbian. But I, I think that when you're using it as an umbrella term, most lesbians aren't offended by being lumped into gay or gay rights or, or things like that. Um, so it's used in, interchangeably. But if you're speaking about the lesbian group specifically, then you use um, lesbians or gay women. But it just describes homosexual technically. And often you'll find more and more these days that it'll be lesbians and gay men. That's how people use it. So more and more gays being, if it's referring to men, they'll say gay men. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of a technical question, but on all those forms, when you change your name, you have to go through a legal process. On all those forms that require you to tick off the M or the F box, how do trans people uh, navigate that? Yeah. This is a very big problem. Um, uh, there, more and more people are trying to encourage uh, service providing agencies on their service intake forms to make space for trans people to recognize this. Um, because right now you would typically find a trans person who is pre-transition uh, would you check off the biological sex, post-transition will tend to check off their gender, their, their felt gender is another word for it. Um, but uh, recently Australia, for example, uh, with their passport applications, are now adding uh, male, female, and um, a third category. Um, but I think that is mostly to recognize intersex conditions rather than the trans, but I think that people are recognizing it as an opportunity for trans people to have a space. Um, and so this is happening, the changes are happening, that forms won't just be the male and the female, because there's not just trans people, but intersex people. Right? Yeah. Another question, I used to um, 
be a pediatric nurse at the kids. And I finished um, training in 1968. And at that time, uh, newborn babies who were born intersex uh, were uh, surgically altered yes. Yes. right at birth based on their parents' decision. And a lot of um, a lot of the nurses, a lot of the medical staff were not comfortable with that at all. And I don't recall a set of parents ever saying, whoa, you know. Um, there, were, there were certain specifications that they had, and they would do a, a buckle smear, they would do a, a, a chromosome study. And I'm just curious, I can't imagine that that's still happening. <coughs> is it? Yes, it is. It is still happening. Uh, I think that is happening. I think that is happening less, but I haven't seen the data to prove that it's happening less. But I assume that it is because, for example, the Intersex Society of North America lobbies very hard to say, "Don't mess with our junk," kind of thing. Right? This is a decision. This is such an important decision, and it's something that people need to decide for themselves. But in the data that exists, which is probably about a decade old or older, as many in one in five hundred infants undergo, as many as 1 in 500, which is about the rate of intersex conditions, undergo surgeries to normalize their genital appearance. Um, and this, can, this surgeries to your genitalia can often result in um, uh, sterilization as well, and non-function of, uh, of, of your reproduction, reproductive functions. So um, it is a very invasive thing, and often it you have to assign, it's, it's, it's arbitrary, right? Is it easier to um, assign a female sex to this baby or a male sex to this baby? And the shortest route, whether it's uh, shaving a, a clitoris or assigning a female sex to a male with a, a stretch, stretch penile length of less than two and a half centimeters, um, that that doesn't mean that the kid is going to grow up and feel like the sex that they were assigned. And they estimate, I've seen data that, that suggests that up to 60% of people who have had a sex surgically assigned to them end up changing later in life. Um, so this is a, an abuse that occurs. I hope it's occurring less than it is. I think it must be, but I don't know. And parents don't know. They will do what the doctor, most of the time they'll do what the doctor recommends. So this is a, an abuse that is occurring um, at, the, at the level of doctors who take an oath not to do that kind of thing. That we were giving blood last week, my husband and I, and we both left going, God, those questions are so bad about have you had sex with a man who's had sex with a man who's had you know, ever any incidents of sex with a man. You know, like it's so totally biased against the gay male suggesting that of course they might be at risk of HIV and I get the history of it but it's time for Canadian blood services to, yeah. to make a change. Yes, the Canadian blood services do actively discriminate against gay men donating blood and I'm not sure if they, if, if, certainly until recently they've not been allowed. If you're a gay man you're not allowed to give blood. I think that may have changed recently or at least it was under review recently so I don't know if it has. Um, statistically, though, gay men do report sexually transmitted infections six times higher rates at six times higher than heterosexual men. So that's why. They just look at the data and say, well, that's it. We're not even going to take the chance. But they're not looking any deeper into it. And also, you know, <laughs> uh, lesbians have the lowest rates of sexually transmitted infections. So why don't they have a campaign encouraging all the lesbians, come on out and get blood. You know? <laughs> you don't even have to test it, you know. So they're discriminating <laughs> negatively against one, but it's not represented in, in their, you know. So I do think that there is a very antiquated way of thinking that is tied to that. I understand why they've done it, but it, and it also then stigmatizes an entire community of people in a very unfortunate way. Um, and it doesn't solve the problem. They're still, you know, they've still got to screen everything. And, uh, you know, there's still from time to time a problem. So it doesn't fix anything, it just creates problems also. Yeah. Can you explain your t-shirt, please? <laughs> um, yes, I can. Well, <laughs> I'm asked that question often. This is, uh, you know, I, the way I've answered it in the past is that, well, if, you know, there's so many things in life that if you cared about um, what people think of you or 
how people treat you or the fears that you might have about this or that or whatever, then you're going to suffer. So all of that stuff I don't care. And the way that I described it recently um, to somebody else was that um, the only thing I care about is quality of life. And everything else I don't care. Everything else. So there are a hundred million things that I don't care about. And there's one that I do. So if there was one thing I didn't care about and a hundred million things I did, then I would wear a shirt that said I care. But um, everything that doesn't fall into the category of quality of life, I don't care about. And I don't think that we should let anything stop us from doing the things that are important, that we need to do, and to have the courage despite the fear. Courage isn't not having fear. Courage is, is acting despite the fear. And so sometimes, a hundred times a day, I have to tell myself I don't care. And so this is a good reminder to me. Kelly, yeah. you've done a few of these talks. I know in town, are you planning to do more? Oh, yes. Good. Yes, you want, this isn't the last you'll hear from me. Be regular. As I prepare the next talk, then I'll schedule it. I don't have a long-term uh, schedule pre-planned, but rather to be just dynamic and to come up with the next relevant topic. The topic that I will be speaking about next will be forgiveness. After my bullying talks, um, I think that this is very, very important. And it's not just people who have experienced... Bullying was relevant because it's now that this topic we need to get it out of the closet, we need to talk about it, we need to solve it before more kids kill themselves as a result of this. So I spoke about bullying, but I used that as an excuse also to talk about cruelty. That was the important thing, because it's not just bullying that is at stake, yeah, that, that's at issue here, it's cruelty. And hurt, and pain, and how that manifests itself into the cycle, right? And so, I use that as an excuse to talk about those, and then I think that after talking about cruelty and hurt and the damage that occurs, then forgiveness becomes the next really relevant topic. And it's not just people who have experienced bullying. It's not just people. Everybody, I think, in my experience, struggles with that subject. So I'm giving it. It's been a few months now, and it'll be a few, maybe a, a month or two more before I'm quite ready. But it's very interesting, and I'm really excited going into this, because it's not what I expected to find when I set out giving it a good think through. And then after that, um, I'll save what the next one is until that talk. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I already know, I'm not gonna save it. So, um, so there will, and I'll just continue. I'll continue until I can't, can't go anymore. This is what I do now. I just wanted to say, in your spectrum of attitudes, there's an attitude you didn't have, which is the attitude I often have. I remember when my, daughter first told me about lesbians, I had never heard such a thing. It's not that I was prejudiced, but I wasn't oh I was it was odd. It was yeah. strange. It was a discomfort with the strain. So now I'm very comfortable with lesbians, but yeah. I find the whole transgender issue is I'm trying to grasp that. So so it's not it's on almost the like the blanks lay on the positive it's yeah. somewhere. The, the shock, <laughs> the shock state. Confusion, confusion. Oh, but, yeah. And a desire to understand yes. and accept. Yes, yes. And I think, I don't, I don't see why that couldn't fit into even as far ahead of, as nurturing is. If there's a desire to understand, just because you don't yet, doesn't mean that you can't support, appreciate, admire, and nurture somebody, you, but you need the information. It's like when I came out to my parents, I mean, I had to come out a couple of times. <laughs> First, I love Sharon, and then second, I'm not your little girl. Um, but they didn't know. And they had all kinds, of, what they did know was thinking, oh, it must be, a, they thought it a choice, and their daughter would never make that choice. And then, like, it's just, I don't understand, I don't understand. But they said right away, but we'll support you. I don't, I don't know how we can, you know, but then they, on their own, on their own time, launched themselves into the education that they needed and read the books and talk to people with a desire to support me and a desire to, for us to be a family and out of love. So I never felt that there was an absence of nurturing or support, even though they didn't understand. So, and so I think that people shouldn't feel ashamed if I... Okay, I've never even heard of it. I don't know what to think about it yet. This isn't something to think that I'm a bad person because I can't just leap out and say, oh, wonderful, let's hold a wedding and let's do this and that and that, you know? It's a process for everybody. I didn't understand a thing for the longest time. And the question is, what do you do? 
in that state of not understanding. I said some things to people that I deeply regret. I remember in high school a gay, a gay boy, a gay student, and he was openly gay and proud of himself. And um, I gave him a speech about how the Bible says this is sin and yada, yada, yada. And I feel so ashamed of that now. I didn't know, but I could have responded differently. Um, so what do you do in that state of ignorance, I think, is the critical part. And if it is to launch yourself into learning and finding out what you need to find out, then you're on the right track. Um, and, but if you're doing something that ends up harming somebody, uh, then you're acting wrong out of ignorance. When you met Sharon, were you still a female? Yeah, student? we got married five years ago. I was still a female, but um, and then in the middle, then finally, I started to dress like a guy. I got a few odd looks, but otherwise, people didn't say anything. And but it was very hard to talk about. Very hard to make those steps. It's an incredibly intimidating thing to to prospect to look at turning the entire the entire world upside down. Mm -hmm. be, you know. So did you have to come out to Sharon? At some point, or did you just well, it's weird. Sharon and her mom are weird. They, they have this intuition for everything. I mean, Sharon's mom guessed that we were. Um, I kept saying that at the time, Calvin was Caitlin, and I was assuming my friends. Caitlin doesn't know it, but he's, she's really um, a guy. <laughs> In, in a female body. Yeah, yeah. And I've never, uh, never had any discussion nope, about it, but I was just but so she knew. obvious to me. I know there were two fears, like there's, um, there's always the fear of going bald, and uh, they also say that um, when some people transition, they, they sometimes find that, like, for example, like a trans guy might have only ever been attracted to women, and then might find themselves attracted to men post-transition. And I thought, oh. <laughs> I mean, no, not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> but uh, it would have been very disturbing to me. It would have changed everything. The time the world turned upside down. Uh, but like, no, that, that, that wasn't the case for me. But I think that that has to do, um, when that does happen, I think that because before, if it had happened, like for example, a trans man, before you're a female, and so you think in a relationship with a guy, it would be as a female with a guy. And so it's wrong, and I can't ever, and, I, and I'm just attracted to women things. But then post-transition, you can see, as a, being, as a guy in a relationship with a guy, it's different. It's as I am. So there may be a bit bisexuality that exists in people that is repressed until you are your natural self, and you can put yourself mentally into the relationship. So I think that, that it doesn't, it's not that transition changes sexual orientation, I think, but rather frees up a person to have a much more wholesome sense of their own sex, natural sexual orientation. So, I'm not bisexual. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> For me. <laughs> um, and I also had a, I had an extra thought about pride, as, a, as I was talking about it, and, you know, happy pride. Today's pride day. I mean, that, I think that that's sort of fantastic. And um, there was a story that I heard this morning about somebody locally who woke up to find that the rainbow flag that they fly outside their house had been pulled down and burned overnight. And they reported this as a hate crime. Um, and that would be a very disturbing thing to experience, I think. We don't know whether it's just kids being idiots, thoughtless idiots, or whether there was a message in that. And to think that that happens here, right here locally. And so when I think about pride, um, that it, I, I often describe, it's, there's no shame. With pride, there's an absence of shame. I am not ashamed of who I am. I will not hide. Those people, I hope, that that, that, that kind of thing, that, that doesn't make you hide. There's no shame. I am who I am. You have your silliness about it, but I am who I am, and I'm, I'm proud. So an absence of shame, but I think that there's more than not being ashamed, more than not hiding who you are. That, that much more subtle quality to pride. And I think that it's, that it's loving yourself. So not, having, not just having no shame, but loving yourself. And when I think about what that means, a, a few weeks ago I spoke at Brockville Pride. And that was their inaugural Pride Week. It's, it's exciting times that we're in. And I talked about pride and the absence of shame and loving yourself and yada, yada, yada. And then at the end of the presentation, I wished I'd done a little better. I was disappointed. I'm often very hard on myself. And so I was, you know, putting my, packing my stuff up, and this lady came up to me, and she was just saying such nice things, and just, ugh, just so, and I, I don't know what to say. I never know what to say, but... I, so I, you know, said, oh yeah, but it was dry and dull, and, uh, you know, but thank you. 
And she was saying, well, why? Because she says, you don't believe me. Why don't you believe me? And I just said, well, I don't know, stand talk about standards I have. And, you know. and then I realized that, that I was getting it all wrong, that I wasn't being loving towards myself. Where's the pride if I am just looking at the negative? When you love yourself, you see the best things about yourself. You don't see the worst. When you see the worst things about yourself, you're not being loving. There's shame or hatred or whatever it happens to be. And so what pride means to me is that in every moment, you find love sees the best truths. It was true that it was dull and dry, <laughs> but it was also true that it was heartfelt. And the things that she saw, she saw because she was looking at it all lovingly. And I didn't see them because I wasn't looking. So, not just no shame, but loving yourself, for better or worse. Seeing the best.